found literary people. So it will be a conversation, and after that, I'm going to open the floor for you guys to have the question answer sessions about these two writers which are uh, sitting beside me. Uh, let's start with Anuba Mehtaji. Anuba Mehtaji, she is a very profound writer, very beautiful person, and has a lot what she has offered to the Canadian diaspora. So let's talk about your contribution and your highlights of your books, because you don't have one book, so I'm not going to give a, a short snapshot of that. I will leave it upon you. How would you like to introduce the audience about your work and your contribution? Halima Ji, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. It is uh, literary festivals like this which are very needed right now in Canada because I think, like I said last year, we are on crossroads. And our South Asian community is growing by numbers and by intellect. So that has to match the creative space as well that we are now going to create. So um, in terms of the Canadian landscape, I put some thoughts together only because we people work in the trenches. Um, as Deepa knows, and we pick up challenges and ideas, and it's forums like these that we'd love to share them, more for getting your input also, so hopefully this is a dialogue, hopefully it's not like my, a monologue. <laughs> the first thing that really strikes me these days, and I'm sure it's not with me only, is the death of the idea. I feel there are not enough ideas that are new anymore. I see things and I see them as refashioned, refurbished, redressed um, as some permutation or combination of the original idea. And I guess what I'm trying to say is how do we map or how do we measure our creative progress in any society at two levels, individual level and at a universal level. So I'm going to put my political science hat on. In 1960s, I'm sure you must have heard of him, da Daniel Bell. He spoke about the death of ideology. He said that all the grand ideas of the 19th and the 20th century have now been exhausted. And they have not been replaced by anything as grandeur and as universal as they were. I don't know if that's true or not, but there are certain things that have happened in our trajectory of art and literature which reflect this. There have been a rise of mass societies. There has been a rise of mass mobilization, mass control, and controlled resistance. So in parliamentary democracies in which Canada comes, we have seen the institutionalization of art. What does that mean? That means that art becomes a political question. That means that we have to see who occupies mainstream when it comes to art and literature. There is no escaping this. Art is a political question these days. So all the points that I'm going to make, in the end, I always want to leave it at a point of hope. I'm not the kind to leave it at a negative. So for this, two things come in mind. One is the idea of space. The more we grow in numbers in South Asia, uh, as South Asians, my privilege I see is my length of stay in Canada. I feel the more I stay in Canada, the more privileged I have the opportunity to, to create more space. But all this will only have one meaning. Only if I can create it, if I can be creative about my space. And the second thing is my hyphenated South Asian identity. Indo-Canadian. You know that hyphen in the middle? That's the thing not to be ashamed of, like many Indians and South Asians were in 1960s. It is something to draw your strength from. It is something that gives you strength and courage and inspiration to draw your stories from. Thank you. So that's my first point. Now, I can go on, but I don't want to hog the space. I have with me uh, Deepa Mahanti. I would uh, let her give the words of gratitude she wants to give to the person she has been um, through here 
to uh, shed upon her own journey. So I let her uh, tell the rest of it by herself. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, first and foremost, a big thank you to Tahir Chi and you for bringing me to the space. You're a filmmaker, and you are at so many other uh, different um, hats you're wearing. So I would like you to introduce yourself to our audience, please. So, yes, so I will start introducing me by a chapter, if you may uh, allow me just for two minutes, and then I will introduce myself so that sure. um, people understand where I'm coming from and what values integrity I bring here onto the table. For sure. So I'm a volunteer, and that is page 147 of my book, Proclamation, a prayer that says, I am a volunteer, a selfless ambassador of the crest. Unconditional service is my mission and courage is my strength. I receive no remuneration but the compassion of my veteran and my community. I'm an auxiliary officer of Peel Police, Regional Police. I assist the sworn officers and the stalwart of the society I bridged the civilian and the uniform community. And what my gratitude to the community and my team is beyond reproach. I humbly will serve as an ambassador to my community, always and re ready to respond to those who ask for my assistance. I will not advertise the nature of my work or <laughs> seek recognition for my endeavors. I voluntarily accept the commitments and hazards of my role and will place the welfare of the community before my own. I am a filmmaker and a storyteller. I have been writing um, so many stories, real and lived experiences, and some of them have been uh, taken by universities across Canada for Master of Psychology students and gear them for the real uh, life scenarios. This is where we are at. So we pick up real and lived stories, create them into audio video, and we work with diversity, equity, and inclusion belonging in the space. Uh, last, in 2022, NFDC India and the Council of General of India had given me an invitation to be at the panel of the South Asian uh, women filmmakers representing India and Canada. This is where we did represent India, South Asian storytelling and how cinema can be an instrument for change, both in our ethnic a society as well as international societies, including Canada. So this is uh, a little bit about myself. Um, and I have 15 years experience in human resources, and this is where I um, bring my connection relationship to people, work across various different globe areas, including Canada, India, UAE, and Europe. Um, and have been associated with many non-for-profits, including Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Canada, Moyo, um, and many more. Um, I do have two companies. One is a media production, and second is a non-for-profit. And I believe the only way of change is when you work with the people on the front line, understanding where they are at, and bringing the stories to life through audiovisual platform. Thank you. So. While we were having a discussion, the very question which uh, occurred in my mind and which is really boggling me, and I would like both of you, whoever want to take it first, both of you to, um, to give me the answer for that. What do you include in writing? Because there was a time when theater, uh, filmmaking, drama, even some of other expressions were included in writing and into the expression of, like this was correlated, but why it is now not considered that way, it is seen and boxed individually. Yes, Deepa, I'll start with you. I would say question is of mindset. Whether you want to take it and amalgate it as a part of storytelling and put different genres is your thought process. Be it rap, be it storytelling, be it prose, poetry, audiovisual films. It boils and stems down from the basic story that you have put into words. I often believe that stories have power. They can heal you and they can tear you. So 
a big kudos to all the story writers and individuals who are in the literal uh, world that bring in the vision of storytelling through their words and expresses to uh, the environment at large. These pieces of words just not touch their hearts, but also bring um, a reflection of their vision and perhaps a change in society. So um, I guess that's I answered it, yeah. yeah. That's your take. So Anuba, how would you like to explain uh, this question or how would you like to tell me about this uh, problem? See, I think this is a very individualized question because each person is unique in their way they create their storytelling. For me, particularly, the integrity or the primacy of the story is supreme. I don't think in terms of written language or the constraint of any one media when I conceptualize my story. So my story is above, does that make sense? So when I conceptualize the story, when I have to literally pull it down and reduce it into the written word, I make sure all the other influences that have gone in my creating that storyline, whether it's painting, dancing, you know, um, theater, folk, oral storytelling from our traditional Indian um, ethos. I bring sp uh, the spirit of all that into the word. And sometimes I feel restricted by doing so. But then, you know, we have our lived experience, which is so authentic that nobody can steal your lived experience from you. So when you integrate the primacy of that concept into your lived experience, that's how I create my story. Now, there's one more layer of constraint that I've always find. So one is picking that concept, that universal concept of the story, reducing it into a written word, and then reducing it further into a language. So English, <laughs> unfortunately, and I can say this because I've suffered through English, and yet English has also given me audiences like nothing on earth because everyone almost speaks English. But English is not the most compromising, gregarious, generous, or even encompassing language. It's restrictive. There are many words in our Urdu, Hindi, Punjabi, other languages of other uh, nations that don't have a translated word in English. And those are my challenges in writing because my story is greater than the written word. Does that make sense? Yes, that absolutely makes sense. Now it makes sense to me to ask the further <laughs> the question that when we see uh, South Asian writers, especially in Canadian diaspora or Canadian landscape, not diaspora, let's see bigger version of it, the Canadian perspective, they're more nostalgic uh, what my observation is, I might be wrong, I might be right, but that's how my take is on that. Then being very much uh, towards the uh, upper upper uh, standard of literature and writing. I feel that everyone has a lived and a unique experience. So we are in a space that we coexist as well as we live our individual lives. Um, when I look around, what connects us is as human beings. Our experience, we feel the same, we think the same, we, we uh, reciprocate um, perhaps the same. Um, considering different cultures and contours, having said that, we are in a terrain that we sometimes coexist and um, have individual um, experiences. So if I may say, uh, we do write about us, and when I say us, it's just not about South Asians, but uh, almagation of experiences that we live every single day in our society and country like Canada. I agree. Thank you, Deepa. Very well said. See, for me, the present cannot be without what we have been in the past, mm -hmm. because our present filter is because of what we've lived in the past. So the past is a part of us. And for those of us who are Buddhists here, Zen Buddhism says we live now in the present. So anything that I'm writing now cannot be devoid of what is happening around me as a writer. 
I don't, I don't speak for everyone, I talk about myself. So the filter is coming from the past, but I'm writing in my present. And the reason I'm able to do so is because we have exactly what you said, the linkages. Everybody has shared experience here, but everyone has a unique slice and take of it to make it individualized. Our base can be of the past through how we are connected, South Asian base. But our experience of Canada as a South Asian is very individual and very unique. Okay, let's talk about AI. AI is a big question because it's eliminating almost all the paperwork and everything. So what is your take? What AI, AI ka booth is doing? I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> because all of us sitting here, um, we all have this question on our head. Is it a threat to us? Are we going to deplete, uh, be depleted? Are we going to get, uh, be out of jobs as writers, authors? Is it a threat to creativity? When companies like Apple start commissioning cover art and they start commissioning uh, audiobooks through AI, then I think, yes, we need to be worried. And I'm sure you all know that right now there's a tidal wave of litigations, class action lawsuits by the community of writers and authors all over America. It's mainly based, again, San Francisco AI, open AI companies, uh, Canada and UK. The Writers Union of Canada is involved in a big way. Authors unions, open letters they have with thousands of signatures. And I would encourage you to find out more and sign up against this petition. So what are they asking for? They are going against two things. Number one, when AI steals copyright, makes it its own interpretation, exactly within my first point, and then puts it out there, that is illegal. And all this litigation is going against that. So there are four things that are on the table that artists, writers, everyone is advocating. The first one is, permission for copyright. If open AI companies like ChatGPT, Google has, um, Google has um, Brad, and Facebook has Meta, when these companies go and take our work, which is copyright, then they need to take permission. That's our first point. Our second point is, they have to pay the author, the creator, the originator of that work. Not just now when they're using it, but on an ongoing basis. Because once it's out there in the dark web, there's no way of bringing it back. Third thing that the Writers Union of Canada, and I'm a part of that, is petitioning against is index that payment for copyright for inflation. Today it's $2, tomorrow it'll be $5, but index it. So the Writers' Union of Canada is actually appealed to the Canadian Parliament to do something about this. So is AI a threat? Here is my view. If your writing is sequential, if your writing is predictable, AI will catch you, and AI is going to drown you. But if your writing has emotional resonance, I still feel there is certain humanness that AI cannot replicate. It's consciousness, it's remorse, it's guilt. There are many human emotions in the spectrum that AI will not be able to replicate to the depth of integrity. And that is the survival of us. This is just my view. So Deepa, I would like you to... I would like you to talk about the aspect of AI in your filmmaking because you were in that area. Uh, I feel like uh, you should talk about that. Sure. So I would uh, also speak about my experience with AI. Yeah, sure. And that's kind of interesting. Yes. So I was given a task of evaluating a software that would interview individuals and these are AI individuals with the moods, personality, and if you would answer a question, they would counter ask a question. 
And I found this very interesting and intriguing because I uploaded my resume and I was all interested to see how is my rendezvous with AI. And it kind of well went well to my surprise because they were picking up my answers and with correlated questions, uh, words, they would ask a counter question. Picking up the moves intentions, I thought, how about me playing a mind game? I asked the AI, as Anuba said, something that dealt with a behavioral question, mm -hmm. a situational question that allows you to think, reflect, reflect, and then respond. What did I see? There was a pause from the AI because they did not regulate the emotions and they diverted the question into something that spoke to them, a language that they would understand. Now getting the pulse where I was going, inside I was kind of happy, okay Deepa, let's go next. So to test myself further, I asked the AI another behavioral question. How would you do that? Or what does a typical day look like? Should there be this scenario? Again, the same fumbles. They diverted and asked me another question. So in my report, I said, the, the AI platform for interviewing is excellent, except that it does not understand human facets, relationships, emotions, that is used in real realm of sense. So technically, it has to go back and be revised in the next stage where it can connect to real individuals and minds and the way of thinking, the behavioral, and how they would be used in the real living world. So does that answer your question? Yes, but it, it is very interesting to say that Elon Musk is working on that too. <laughs> so you should be very aware of that. Okay, so it's ongoing and never-ending discussion which we can put on and on and on. There must be very, uh, like a lot of questions. So we come to the floor. Anybody has any question about what so far we have discussed? My name is Anwar. I'm 78 years. So that's my strength or weakness, whatever you say. So I am happy that I came here. Very enlightening discussion. It's about the career for writers. Let me start the, in the reverse. My grandson has done uh, honors with distinction from University of Toronto in English. And this is what he knows better than any other subject. But he couldn't find a job as a writer or because of knowledge of English. So he had to look for a job, more mundane job, a commercial job, so where he's doing purchasing and those things, in which there's no interest. But because you have, to, you have need bread, so he's still working but extremely dis disinterested and frustrated. So my question to you is, what are the career for people who are good in English? He's, he's extremely good. He has got Dean's Scholar and he's got distinction in English. So I want him to go to Harvard, but say, what can I do there? If I go to Harvard and get Masters, I'll have the same problem as I'm having now. So that's one, what is the option for him? Sure. Congratulations, by the way, about your grandson. This is a big thing. He should be very proud, and we are proud of him at that age to accomplish so much. So having said that, if he's a writer, then simply write. Tell him to write every day. Tell him to uh, join all these, you know, Authors Guild Writers Union. It's a small fee for a whole year the kind of connections he'll get, the kind of platforms he'll get, the opportunities he'll get to get into different programs over there. They even give grants for further things, and they give him publications. So he'll become published. So that's his thing he can do on the side. The career path, the career path, I would say, suggest he can there's publishing houses that take editors, copywriters, and if they don't hire him, then he can start his own, own business with, because all of us who write, we need good editors, we need good script, you know, uh, checkers. You need, 
as a filmmaker. But the main thing is keep his hope up. Please, aap sab, in sab ke liye ek dafa phir se taaliyan bada dijiye, ta ke they feel appreciated for their job. <laughs>